are so blessed. Uh, Abner uh, made a decision. Uh, well, we, t- we asked him to, but uh, he, he is uh, staying over to preach uh, for us today. Uh, he's traveling all over the world. Uh, love him dearly. Uh, he started coming to our church a long, long time ago in the ark, and God has raised him up and put him uh, in, in nations uh, where incredible signs, wonders, and miracles are happening. The Word of God is happening. Uh, the revelation that God is giving him uh, concerning this day and time because his ministry is a prophetic uh, ministry. And there's something in the Bible that uh, I want to read that I, I just really honor him uh, for doing this because I, I get to spend time pouring into him at times. And it says this, Timothy, uh, Paul was writing to Timothy. He said, hold fast to the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith, love which are in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed to you keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. And I just thank God that this is a young man who has kept his conscience pure. He's kept his life uh, before God to be pleasing to him. Uh, He spends time fasting and praying uh, and seeking God. And I'm just so uh, blessed uh, to see this younger generation of ministers and prophets and and pastors and teachers uh, that God is raising up, like myself, younger generation, that God God is raising up in this day and time that literally is not afraid of the devil, is not afraid of what's going on, but is moving forward in faith, believing to see God do some great and mighty things. And that is the Davids of this time, the Joshuas, uh, the Josephs, uh, the Marys, the Esthers uh, that God has raised up. Turn to somebody next to you. He's talking about you right now. He's talking about you. Amen. Coming to love, would you stand? Would you welcome Abner Suarez as he comes to minister the Word of God to us today? Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give the Lord Jesus a big... We honor you, God. We honor your name today. Would you just repeat this with me? Say, Father, Father, I receive everything you have for me today. No matter what it looks like. Open up your word to me. I will hear and I will do everything you say. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning. Do you know, uh, if you shoot for 120, when you reach 60, you're only midway. So some of you need to stretch out your faith there. Uh, real quickly, I want to tell you about the resource table we got back, at, uh, back there. It is really, really difficult to go where God wants you to go if you don't know where he wants to take you. Amen. So this is a, a book I wrote about four years ago. It's called Creation Reborn. I believe it's a, a partial prophetic look into, I say partial, because how many know God, that God doesn't tell everything to one person? So it's a partial prophetic look into where I believe God wants to take the people of God in the next season. And then uh, we, we actually recorded this last year. It's called uh, Faith, a One Day Gathering. Do you know the great thing about the gift of faith is everything you need from God you can receive by faith. That's right. And everything that God has ever told you to do and everything that... Uh, would, would pertain to your family, to your purpose. It's already been decided in eternity. And if you'll access it by faith and not in your own strength, you will live the victorious life that God intends you to. Yeah. There's no such thing as mediocre, wimpy Christians. You know, I've had the privilege of ministering, literally prophesying over thousands of people and I have never, ever told anyone, hey, your life's going to be really mediocre and God's really shooting for middle income for you and uh, you're really not that good looking, so just kind of settle for the middle of the road. I've never told anyone that. He's always, whew, whew, whew. And what you'll just soon discover is your ability to agree with him is really key. God could intend something for you and your inability to receive it cause you not to live in the fruit of it. 
So get that. And then this is uh, called Encounter School. It's a, um, uh, is but with a friend of mine I did in Wilmington last year. It's all about teaching you how to uh, grow in your fellowship with God. So you should buy everything on that table. It would be very beneficial to you. Uh, I do want to thank you as a church. You guys support our ministry every month. You're he- literal. You know, a, it's unfortunate, but not everyone does what they say they will do. As a believer, your goal should be for your word to be like God's word. Yes. You can cash the check as soon as you say it. And then if you say something and you, you didn't quite mean it, you should do it anyway. You know, even as a young child, the Lord, uh, the, the, my father taught me that. He said, if you tell somebody you're going to do it, you better do it. Even if it's uncomfortable, even if it causes you sleep, do what you told them you would do. He was teaching me about God's word. When we don't do what we say we will do, it causes the world to question the word of God. Because you're the word of God that they're supposed to see. And usually when we don't do what we say, it's because we don't believe God will do what he would say. It comes down to the smallest things. Hey, I'll call you in the next hour. But you don't ever call anyone back. Usually that's an insecurity because you don't want the person to feel bad that you really don't want to talk to them. So you you, you settle for making them feel good in the moment, knowing full well you'll never call them. It's an identity thing. Most things are. But this people, your leader, leaders, are people of their word. He has never failed to send me our ministry what he told me he would send me. And I can count on it. Our ministry can count on it. And your giving helps go around the world. 11 nations last year, 8 nations this year. And let me just tell you, don't focus on the evil. Focus on God's agenda because this is the greatest time to be alive. Stay the course. Telling you, for some people in this room, you need to stay the course. The enemy, I just picked it up. The enemy has tried to get you off the path even this week. But I'm telling you, the great, one of the greatest things I've learned from the Lord is stick to the plan. If God didn't tell you something different, stick with the plan. Okay, I believe I have a word um, for the church, but just for a moment, um, Pastor Al kept seeing this this morning, and it was the Lord wants to promise you today that the choices that you have made and the choices you will make in the last part of your life will cause a ripple effect in generations of ministers in your family. And it will be like David, where years from now, even when you have transitioned, the word of the Lord to your to a generation to come after you will be because of my servant Al has made these choices. I will treat you this way. And the Lord says, you are like David in the last season of his life where he prepared things for Solomon to come and the greatest glory that was ever seen in the nation of Israel came in that period. And I see Jesus standing in front of you and he's touching your ears to hear the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord is gonna come to you as never before and a, a, a mantle of miracles is falling upon you as never before. And the Lord says, I have saved the last for your life and for your ministry and your greatest years of the miraculous, your greatest years of souls, and your greatest years, even the Lord says, of supernatural financial abundance. You will leave abundance for your children's children in this season. Shekemokaya. And a grace to mentor the next generation through the wisdom on the inside of you. The Lord says, you'll do well to spend your time with the next generation. Because as you speak, you will cause them 
to not make certain mistakes and elevate their purpose and their fruitfulness in the earth as never before. And I also saw this for you, Tave. I saw um, the grace on your life and the wisdom on your life being replicated through small groups, through conferences, through different things, through the wisdom of God for women of the next generation. And that there was a grace on your life for, um, the only phrase I hear is to be a great helpmate for people's husbands. And there's a grace and the Lord is, there's two books inside of you that you need to write that need to be released in this next season of your life. And the Lord says he is quite pleased with the work of your hand. And that he brought you here to Fayetteville to change the trajectory and the history of this region to write it from heaven's perspective. And I see like, um, like this, this angel holding this scroll in heaven and it was like he's standing there and Jesus has got this big smile on his face and, and, and it, it, it's like it was pleasing to the Father that you obeyed with him and partnered with him to do God's desire for this region. And I feel the compassion of the Lord for this region and for the city of Fayetteville. And the Lord wants you to know this city was better the day you came into the city limits to plant this church. And the Lord says it was a covenant of love to this city. And the Lord says to the group of the people here, you are in a strategic place. You are in a strategic place for strategic plans and for strategic purpose. The Lord says understand the times and the seasons in which you live in. Understand that this is not just a man-made thing. This is a God-ordained thing. The Lord would say that I planted you here. I specifically planted you here on this land uh, as a birth from heaven. The heaven birthed the womb of this house. And the Lord says because heaven has birthed you, there is a great responsibility upon the people of God in this room. There is a responsibility to walk in the ways of God. There is a responsibility to disregard even religious systems and even things that would hinder the work of the Lord. And the Lord would say, if you will follow my voice in this season, there will be a door unlocked in heaven for the glory of the Lord and for the miraculous power of God and even for the salvation of your family as Never before. Thank you, Lord. There's a presence of the Lord here. There's like an unusual anointing here this morning. The miraculous power of God is here. Somebody's uh, right shoulder, the Lord is healing your right shoulder. Somebody, uh, three people in this room, you battle, at least three, you battle uh, depression, and the Lord is delivering you from depression right now. Two of you will actually physically feel the fire of God on you. Somebody's like uh, right elbow, I believe it was an athletic injury, it's like difficult to put out. If you'll just start moving your elbow around, the Lord will heal you. So just be healed today in Jesus' name. Prophetically, if you could see in the spirit, there's a door. I'm telling you there's a door in this room. If you'll walk through it by faith and following the voice of the Lord, you will encounter the Lord in the coming weeks as never before. There's a door into the kindness of God. There's a door into lifting off all the heaviness. There's people in this room, you go from good days to bad days, and the Lord wants, to, wants you to live completely free in peace in him. Somebody's right knee, the back of somebody's right knee, the Lord is healing somebody's right knee. Thank you, Lord. It's 
really interesting, huh? How the voice of God shifts things in a room. The very voice of God that speaks through people created the universe. God's ideas are articulated through the words that he speaks. So the knowledge of God is communicated through words. And those words, through the faith of God, created the world. When time began, God created the heavens and the earth. How many know that God didn't need a place to live? But he creates a place called heaven and chooses to live there. Psalm 11 verse 4 said, the Lord is in his holy temple and the Lord's throne is in heaven. So God speaks the universe into existence and then he creates this heavenly man. Why do you call him heavenly? Because man was made in the image of God. He wasn't a, a, a little God, but he had an aspect of the personality of God. Why, why, why do we mourn when we see tragedies like what happened yesterday? Because every one of those people, no matter if they were black, white, or, or uh, uh, a certain religion, we mourn because they were made with the image of God and they're made in the dignity of God. And so they, they are greatly valued in heaven. And this is what God does in Genesis 1. Genesis 1, Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Now this is a key phrase here in verse 26 if you're following along this morning. Hope you brought your Bibles. That doesn't happen most places I go. <laughs> and he says this, let them, let them, let them, let them. Key phrase. He doesn't say let us. He says let them. Who's them? Humanity. Let them have what? Dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over all the cattle. And then again, he emphasizes this concept. Over all the earth, over all the earth, over all the earth, over all the earth. So he goes, let them, and then he says, over all the earth. So what are they over? All, what are they over? The earth. That's why God's in heaven, because he's putting man on the earth to be his representative of heaven. And you'll watch this pattern. There's a pattern that'll happen. Man and woman was created to be ambassadors. They were created not to start a religion, but to represent a kingdom. When I was in, um, in July, I was in uh, London. And I, I went on this tour, this bike tour. It was lots of fun. And we stopped on part of the tour for coffee. And that, the tour got even better when we stopped for coffee. And I looked to my left, and there was the Canadian embassy. Very interesting. In the middle of London, there's a territory that is part of a different nation. And if you go into that Canadian embassy, all the laws of Canada apply. And the job of that ambassador is not to give his opinion. The job of that ambassador is to represent the country that he comes from. And what you'll see in a minute, in the, in the natural, we see this in ambassador, but that ambassador does not worry of how he's going to get from Canada to London. His sending government has everything provided for. And if you ask that Ambassador, what, what, is, what is the opinion of your country? He never goes, well, I kind of think this, but my country's position is this. He's getting fired. His only responsibility is this. What is your opinion of same-sex marriage? What is your opinion of abortion? What is your position on the Middle East? He said, the position of my country is this. And everywhere I go, my sending government that all those rules apply. 
So man is made the ambassador. Verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created male and female. He created them. Male and female is the foundation of healthy societies. That's why you see so much attack on it. Verse 28, this is key too. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. So what's happening here? He puts man as the steward of the earth, and he creates man, and the first voice, catch the pattern, there's a biblical pattern. God's word, God's faith is being communicated. It's creating the world, then it creates a man, and the first voice that, God, that, that Adam hears is the voice of God. The knowledge of God is communicated to man through the voice of God. How does Adam know what to do? He hears the voice of God. That voice, when he receives it, qualifies him to be the steward of the earth. But that voice doesn't stop there. Genesis 2. How many know that God doesn't tell you everything you need to know at one time? Genesis 2, verse 8. And the Lord God planted a... Let me point also this out. The voice of God qualifies Adam, and Adam is not created to take care of himself. Really important. So what's, what's, what's really important about, about what's happening there? Adam, you're in charge of the earth. But here's the good news, Adam. I have everything taken care of, but you have to trust my voice. What is trust? The foundation of their relationship was faith. So how did Adam, how was Adam supposed to bring in the resources that God had already provided him into the earth? By faith. Look at verse 8. And the Lord planted a garden eastward. There he put man whom he had had, whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord made every tree to grow that is pleasant to sight and good for food. Notice that he makes him a steward of the earth, and those trees don't grow until he puts Adam in that garden. Why don't they grow? Because Adam was supposed to take care of the growth of those trees. Notice, too, he didn't put him in a, in a prayer room. God's mind, there's no secular and there's no spiritual. Everything that Adam did was supposed to be a worshipful act unto God. Now a river went out from Edom to the, to the water in the garden. From it parted and became four rivers. And the name of its first is Pishon, and which it is, is one which skirts the whole land of Havilah where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Bedulin, onyx, stones are there. The name of the second river is Gihon, and it is, it is one which goes around the whole cush. The name of the third river is, is Hedek, and it is the one which goes towards the east of Assyria, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. Now, it's very interesting that God tells us that he puts gold in the garden. Where else is there gold? In heaven. So the knowledge of God that created heaven with streets of gold also created the earth. And now Adam's job is to extend the kingdom of God on the earth through the heavenly wisdom that he has. That same wisdom that created heaven, he's supposed to extend heaven on earth. Also catch what's happening. This was just the beginning. Perfection. Think about this. It was perfect there. But that was just the beginning. It was only supposed to get better and better and better and better and better. The same wisdom that created heaven is now given to Adam to make the earth look like heaven. What did God want to do? God wanted to 
rest his throne in heaven, make man his ambassador on earth, have him enjoy the earth forever. But when he came down to earth, he'd go, Adam, this is wonderful. The place that I've put you in looks just like the place that I live. Verse 15, and the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to, to tend it and to keep it. Notice there that that word that he puts him in the garden, that word there is literally he puts him to rest in the garden. Why is that important? Because I believe when he's saying that I'm putting him to rest in the garden, he's letting him know this is not something you've earned. This is just by virtue of me creating you. I'm giving you all this brilliance. This is not, the more I walk with the Lord, the more I'm convinced this. This relationship between God and man has never been about what you can do for God. It's about what he's already done for you. So he's already spoken to him. Now he puts him in the garden. And here's the second part. Verse 16. And the Lord commanded the man saying. Notice he speaks to him in the garden. Now he speaks to him again. Critical directions here. He doesn't just speak to him once. What is he doing? He is building his, he, 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 is, he is giving him knowledge from the relationship he has. He is building on the knowledge he's already given him in the garden. Now he's speaking to him again. How does he get that information? He's in relationship with God. And he commanded the men saying, of every tree of the garden you may eat freely, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day that you eat it, you shall surely die. And then Genesis 3. See, there's this pattern of God speaking, his will being done, and then we know Genesis 3 is where the change happens. Genesis 3, 1, the serpent was more cunning than any of the beasts of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of the tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Notice that God had already told them to subdue, but they're dialoguing. Some of you don't need to dialogue with the enemy. You just need to subdue it. God already told you what to do with that snake. And the serpent said, you will, you will not surely die for God knows in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now verse 6 is critical. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and tree desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate it. Notice what happens. The voice of the enemy comes to her. It challenges the, the, it challenges the purpose of God, and that voice causes her to look a certain way. And she looks at that tree. There's two voices in the earth. One is the voice of the enemy, and one is the voice of God. What you put attention to comes in your heart, and it projects uh, an image. And if you, if you look at that image long enough, it will become your behavior. And if you keep doing it, the wrong thing, it's what the Bible calls a stronghold. So two competing voices now came in the earth and God's voice was supposed to always dominate everything. But we know things went the wrong way. But in the Old Testament, God was still very much concerned with speaking and people following his voice. Exodus 19, this is God speaking to the nation of Israel. Now, now therefore... If you will indeed, what does he say? Obey my voice, obey my voice, and keep my covenant. Then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. How did God's voice come? His voice came to Moses on a mountain. He gave him commandments. Then he gave him the law. And what God said in that law was the voice of God. 
He said, listen to the voice of God. I'm giving you my voice. Follow this voice. In fact, later he says, he says, I have set before you. How can he set before someone? Because he's given them. He goes, focus on the voice. Focus on what I've said. Focus right here. Because if you focus right here, even in this fallen world, there is life right here. You can choose blessing or you can choose cursing. But in my voice is life. And then he emphasizes, I call this the Old Testament template. He says this, surely God does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. What were prophets in the Old Testament? They were literally the voice of God. So what's he saying? I don't do anything in the earth unless it is spoken through the voice of God. Then he says this, 2 Chronicles 20, 20. So early in the morning, they went up out of the wilderness and they went out and Joseph stood and he said, hear me, O Judah, you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. Again, the Old Testament, he is still emphasizing. You follow the voice, you follow the voice, you follow the voice. That's where your prosperity is hidden. That we know, New Testament, Jesus redeems all that was lost in the garden. And now, if you receive Jesus, what are you? You are a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. But God still has this desire to teach his people his ways. God still has, in fact, we all need to be re-educated. And we know the focus of Jesus' teaching was change your thinking. Change your thinking. Because if you don't change your thinking, you will not learn how to think like me. It's important to understand this, though. That when we see Jesus, we see God's primary intent for humanity. Adam didn't fully fulfill what God intended for him. And Jesus comes as the second Adam, and for the first time, he displays God's original intent for humanity. Everything you see in, in, in Jesus, with the exception that for the first time, God lived in a man God, in, everything you see in Jesus, with the exception of that, is this. That, it's these words. <laughs> everything you see in Jesus was God's intention for Adam. Adam was sinless. Jesus was sinless. Adam was not created to take care of himself. How did Jesus operate in the earth? He listened to the voice of God. And then he makes this statement. Look at this, John the 8th chapter. Then Jesus said, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and I do nothing of myself. I do nothing of myself. Stop right there, that's important. He says, I do nothing of myself. But Jesus had a will. In fact, when he's praying right before he, he leaves the earth, he goes, not my will, but your will be done. So how can he say, I do nothing of myself? It's this. His will had now completely surrendered to the Father's will. And catch this. In his mind, he would never, ever consider doing anything that God, didn't, God the Father did not want him to do. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Never considered doing anything outside the Father's will. The rest of the statement is really fascinating. But as my Father 
has taught me as my father has taught me. Wait, wait, wait. This is, this is, this is a little out there. Jesus, fully God, fully man, was taught by his father in heaven. I want to suggest to you, God wants to teach us some things if the perfect son of God had some things to learn. And notice, too, that he says, as the Father has taught me, I speak these things. Do you want to know where you're really at with something? It's what's coming out of your mouth. Not so much, amen, I believe in healing, amen. It's what happens when a relative gets sick. Do you go, well, it's going to get real bad now. Call the doctor. Or do the healing scriptures come up? Here's some principles that are really important about walking out truth. The Bible is absolute truth. The truth found in scripture is absolute. The Bible teaches the necessity of believers hearing his voice. This is what Jesus taught. He says this, Matthew 4 verse 4. Man shall not live by bread alone. Notice he's making a natural comparison. He's saying man cannot live without food in his body. You cannot live without my voice. That's why the enemy fights the voice of God. That's why the enemy puts all these weird ideas in the sight of belief. Well, that's a little crazy. You know, he's talking about God hearing them and all this stuff. You should Say, I hear the voice of God. Because he tells you, my sheep hear my voice. I know it's gotten abused. I know it's got some weird examples, but it doesn't make it, it does not make it a biblical truth. The purpose of knowledge through his voice is to bring personal transformation. Knowledge that you hear must have corresponding action. The Bible teaches, if you say you have faith, but you don't have corresponding action, you're a liar. The truth that we hear was meant to be expressed in experience. Truth that is not expressed with corresponding experience is just a theory. The understanding of truth is to transform the world around us. Now, here's a really, really big point right here. Our understanding of truth must be progressive. Often, believers stop in foundational things. They call foundational things their destination. Oh, I got the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Oh, I, I prayed for somebody. I prophesied a few times. Oh, I did this. Praise the Lord. And they stop where God wants to give increase and 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 increase, and increase everything they do. And there's this tendency to become com comfortable with how it works. Oh, I'm doing well now. Oh, I've got, gotten ahead because I've been trusting God. Now I'm better. My, and it's just like, okay, hit the cruise. There is no cruise control in the kingdom of God. It's constant upgrade. Constant upgrade. It's constant stretching and stretching and stretching and stretching and stretching and stretching like Gumby. And you'll never snap because your mind was meant to constantly expand. If you are still operating in the same anointing that you, you had when you, when you got born again 10 years ago, something's wrong. If your worship life has not been upgraded in six years, something's wrong. If your prayer language is still the same as it was three years ago, there's something really wrong. If you haven't grown in the gifts of the Spirit, something's wrong. You have traded an American idea of God for the authentic gospel of the kingdom. Our understanding of truth must be progressive. Over 20 years ago, 
I, 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 I literally saw myself going around the world. This is what's going to happen. This is how it's going to work. This is going to... But that was just the word that qualified me. I'm not perfect. I haven't arrived. But you have to stay this course. And, I, and, and, and so many different things that happened in, along that path where I've learned you have to follow that voice. I would be lost without that voice. Look at uh, Matthew 28. This is Jesus as he, after he has ri risen. And now he's standing in front of his disciples. He's lost one. Look at uh, verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee to a mountain in which Jesus is appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. That's so funny to me. <laughs> if you've ever doubted, you're in line with the apostles of the Lamb. They've walked with him for three and a half years. He's, they, they were on the inside of everything he did, and he's resurrected, and they go, look what the Lord has. Done. Is that him? I mean, it's funny. But they didn't stop at their doubt. See, it's, it's what you do with those thoughts of doubt. Everybody doubts in this room. Or has thoughts of doubt. It's if you allow that thing to wrap itself around your heart, it will destroy you. But if you go, no, this is what God has said. God has said, my kids will serve the Lord. God has said, I am an overcomer. God has said, God has said, God has said. Some of you need to rise up and say, this is what God has said today. And Jesus came and spoke to them and said, all authority. Notice, Adam lost the authority. Jesus came to give you those keys of authority. If he has all authority, guess who has no authority? The devil, his demons, they have no authority. The only authority they have is if you refuse to take your authority. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Notice he links the two because he wants the, the two to be one through the authority he gives to the church. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. The Lord is longing for a group of people who will fill cities with the doctrine of Jesus. The Lord's heart is longing for people who would not be passive. The Lord's heart is longing for people who would follow his voice. The Lord's heart is longing for transformational people who will transform cities for him. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all the things I have commanded, with you, commanded you. And lo, I am with you to, always, to even to the end of the age. Notice, in the beginning, he starts with a command to man. And then in the commission that he gives to man, he starts with another command. But think about how outrageous his command is here. He's standing with 11 men. Some are still doubting. They've all scattered except one. And then he stands on a mountain. That's important. Because when the voice of God comes, it elevates you over all your circumstances. If there was ever a word, a prophetic word that was out of place, it was this one to Jesus, to Jesus to his disciples. All authority, Jesus, I don't know if you know this. They killed you. And we all ran away. And now you're talking about we're going to, we're going to disciple nations? The word that he spoke to them did not have anything to do with the culture of the environment they were in, but it was supposed to define the environment that they were in. 
That commission qualified them, but they had to stay near him to know the next thing to do. This is critical for your life because this is, I, I see this, this is where sometimes people miss the turns. It's like, the Lord called me to do this. Yes, I'm going to be a business, I'm going to be a business owner. Yes, I'm ready to start tomorrow. And they miss the progressive understanding of where God wants to take them. Because here's the joy of the Lord. God enjoys you walking out your purpose. God en enjoys you walking by faith. But he is really, 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 and Americans are not, he's really interested in the process of what you're going to go under through to get there. He sees the end product, but he sees it from the inside out. Often we see it from the outside in. And if we get there, when we think we should get there, it would destroy us. Look at Acts 1. Verse 4, and being assembled together with them. Notice they're still close to him. They didn't just run out. They stayed close to him. Yes, yes, Lord, we received this word, but how are we going to walk out this word? It's a little crazy out there. If they don't get this instruction, they cannot have the power to do what he just told them on that mountain. It's progressive. It doesn't just, it's not just stationary. It's not just, I'm here, and now I know what to do. It's, I'm here, now I'm walking in relationship. And as I walk in relationship, he teaches me how to stay unoffended. He teaches me to go deeper in worship. He gets rid of all these issues that I have. And then I begin to walk this thing out to become more like him when I inherit the promise. Being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart for Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So what's he telling them? He said, don't, I know I told you to go, but before you go, you need a filling of the Holy Spirit. You need to be empowered with the same thing that I was full of. You can't do that word without the empowerment. So what's he doing? He is building upon the previous revelation, but they needed, the, they needed that first thing he said to position them in the right place. That word qualified them. The next word positions them to receive the power to begin to walk that thing out. But you'll see, they didn't stop by getting filled once. They got filled over and over. And then persecution came. And they go, notice too, they are not defined by their environment. When persecution came, they didn't, they didn't go, well, well, let's get together a committee, Peter. We'll stop doing the healings out in the marketplace. We'll put them in a back room because people don't understand that. You know what they did? They didn't change what God told them. They said, apparently, now it's going to be a little harder. So, Holy Spirit, fill us again. Strengthen us again. Fill us with your spirit, God. We need more of that because we still have that commission. That is a word for some of you. You've moved off the commission because of what you saw. But I'm here to tell you, stay the course of what God has told you. Now the danger becomes that if you do not progress in truth, you will cease to be relevant and you will re embrace a religious mindset, void of power to change you and change the world around you. And this is why this is so on the heart of God, because our religious systems cannot change our nation. They don't care about our shofar, about our oil, about our nights of worship, unless it can bring practical transformation to the world around them, and we become that invitation. Look at Mark 2. I think we looked at this last year, but important here. Mark 2, verse 18. The disciples of John and the Pharisees were fasting. Then they came to him. 
And they said, why did the disciples of John and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Stop right there. Is fasting a good thing? Okay, three of you know, fasting is a New Testament thing. So these guys, the disciples of John and, and, and the Pharisees, they are doing a good religious act. That is good. That is right. You should fast. I got one amen to that. Like, hey, we have a, we have a deal after church. Amen. <laughs> so he's not speaking against fasting. Then Jesus said, can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and they will fast in those days. Notice, he throws that back in. He goes, don't think you're getting away with fa without fasting. He says this, no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, or else he or else the new wine, the new piece pulls away from the old and the tear is made worse. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins or else the new wine bursts the wineskin and the wine is spilled and the wineskins are ruined. But the new wine must be put into the new wine skin. Now wine can be compared to the continuous outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the continued flow of the present active ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life. And he tells him, he said, you can't receive the new outpouring in the earth because your wineskin, or I want to suggest to you, your mind is incongruent with receiving that type of operation of the Holy Spirit. Because somewhere along the line, and notice too, these are guys, one of them, one group, the, the disciples of John the Baptist. They heard the voice of God at one time. The majority of the religious community of their day said, that ain't God. God is not in that. And these guys go, no, God's hand is on that. So they followed what God was doing in the earth. But somewhere along the line, and then you got the Pharisees who loved the law, but then began to love their own interpretation of the law more than the law itself. So here they are settling on traditions, loving those traditions. And the other guys who heard the voice of God go, this is it. This is, this is the only revival that's ever coming to earth. We're standing right here, baby. And disciples back then fasted. So they're going, we're fasting like we always do. And these other guys are going, we got the traditions. You know, we're, we're, we're the best. We, we love the word of God. No, actually what they did, they began to love how they practiced the word of God more than the word of God. And now Jesus' ministry is in the earth and they're celebrating. Why are they talking to him? Partially because they're offended. How come the move of God didn't come through us? We're righteous. We're in the temple all the time. We tithe everything and we tell everyone what we give to missions. They didn't progress. And the answer to their prayers was always to be Jesus, the Yeshua Messiah. So what happened? God moved and kept moving. He's way over there. And because they refused to change, they cease to be relevant in the earth. Every form of Judaism that does not see Jesus, the Yeshua, as the Messiah, as the answer to the law is completely irrelevant in the earth today. It's aberrant and has, it does, no, nothing even comes close to anything you find in the Old Testament. What happens? Because when you, you, when you cease to progress, you open up yourself to a door to the demonic. Hear that. 
I'm not here to push buttons at anyone, but the Methodist movement was about meth- mythology, uh, a method to be holy and righteous. And he gave them instructions, Wesley. We want to be holy because we realize there's another work after we get born again. We want to emphasize being holy before God. But it was always supposed to progress to more. But they created a monument. They said, this is where, this is how God, this is the wineskin we're going to take. And because they stayed in that place, I forget how many years ago I was reading the other day. I could not believe. They said, the Methodist Convention, I forget which one it was. We're meeting to discuss whether homosexuals should be ordained bishops. So the place of holiness and righteousness, the strength that that movement carried, because it didn't progress, now has become an open door for the enemy. And people still show up every week. I'm Methodist. I love God. And before you think it can't come to conserv- uh, uh, charismatics, We like our worship. Pastor Al, he goes a little long, but you know, we like him. Give a good word every Sunday. What would happen if a harvest came so strongly here? Did he have to come two hours early to get a seat? Well, well, things ain't, things ain't been the same since, you know, they started letting those people come. I'll go somewhere more comfortable. Well, you know, I've been here seven years and they finally asked me to do something. I didn't sign up for that. I'm very busy. I got a lot going on. Wrong wineskin. Here's some practical keys to walking in progressive truth. God wants to speak. We must know his voice. But here's something about the nature of God that you have to understand. He is holy and he is righteous. The reason I say that, because there's an aspect of him that will not give people something they do not want. Holy is, I'm, I'm, I, holy is everything I do is with integrity. So in my integrity, I'm not going to give you something you will not do anything with or not hungry to receive. Jesus said this when he walked the earth. I still have many things to tell you. You know what, when he says that word things, the, the definition is there. I still have truth for you to carry. God wants to give you truth that you will carry. God wants to give you truth that actually could bring complete healing to your family. God wants to give you truth that could bring healing to the nations of the world. And here's what I want to land the plane with today. Hear me and hear me correctly. There is the wisdom of God, that heavenly wisdom that created the world, that is being made available to the people of God. But if you don't position your heart correctly, you will sit in a religious system and you will say amen and God has moved way down the line. It's fascinating, right? He goes, I know what you need before you pray. But then he says, ask me. What's he doing? He's looking for the willing, hungry heart. You know what will keep you humble? God hasn't told you everything you need to know yet. And God doesn't hide everything he needs just between you and him. Well, I don't feel that. Well, you've been sitting for six weeks and your pastor's been telling you, It doesn't matter what you feel. Receive the word of the Lord. Maintain a childlike heart. Unless, he said, this is Jesus. I, 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 surely I say to you, unless, notice he uses this word, converted and become as a little children, you will be, you will no means enter the kingdom of God. He uses that word converted. Sometimes the dysfunction that we've experienced has to make, makes us have to relearn being children. 
Your God can do anything. Your God wants to help you. This is good news. God wants you as free as him. No issues. No troubles. Everything seen from that secret place. So maintain a childlike heart. I'll close with this. It's important that you know that God has probably already likely spoken to you many things of your purpose, of your future. That word that he gave you qualifies you to live in that. However, the choices you're making right now will determine if you actually live that future out. Joseph gets this dream when he's 17 years old. Amazing dream. You're going to be the prime minister of a nation. Shockingly, his brothers were not really excited. Are we really going to bow to you? See, your destiny hinges on such a supernatural release and God orchestration that it can only be God. He gets this word. That qualifies him to be the prime minister. Yet he's going to have to make Years and years and years of choices correctly if he's going to live that thing out. That's right. So your future is created by saying yes today, but also knowing that you have choices that must measure up to what God told you. Yes. Are you going to be a millionaire? Yes, Lord. But I keep spending more every month. You might get the million, but you might have to use it to pay all your debt off for all the bad choices you make. <laughs> Did you receive this word today? Yeah. If you receive this word, why don't you stand to your feet and give God praise? <laughs> give God praise. Lift your voice. Come on, lift your voice. Would you just lift your hands to heaven? There's an impartation right now without anyone laying hands on you. I'm telling you, the Lord Jesus himself is in this room. He'll touch your ears now to hear his voice as never before. Father, today I bless your people to not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds at the mouth of God. I declare that as you position your heart correctly, the progressive understanding of the purpose of God would overwhelm your life today. I declare that as you listen to the voice of God, fellowship and encounter with the Lord is coming to your life as never before. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord cause His face to shine upon you. Any area of your body that's out of alignment, I, arthritis is being healed now. I declare your body is being healed in Jesus' name. Would you look this way? Thank you very much. God bless you, Pastor Al. Amen, 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 amen. What does the Bible say? He that hath an ear to hear... Let him hear what? What the Spirit of God is saying.